Huh? Yeah, I'm just seeing if I get this set up right. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jen Coffey. And uh, I'm happy to be here with everyone today. And I titled this program, Knives, Lipstick, and Liberty, all about activism. And the reason I did that was because uh, a lot of people who do know what I do um, wonder how I do it. And I'm trying to encourage other people to join me and to become more active in our, our world. So I suppose I should start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a mom. I've been married for over 20 years to my wonderful husband, Billy. And years ago, probably about six years or so ago, um, I started to become active in my world. And I say that because I think I was somebody who was pretty, um, pretty average. Uh, you know, go to work, come home, take care of the family, and that, uh, didn't really pay much attention to what was going on in my world. You know, if I watched the news, it was to see the weather report. It really wasn't to pay attention outside of that. And my husband would try to get me more involved in how our, our world was changing and what kind of an effect that was going to have on our son and on our futures. And I really wouldn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Um, so I started to become somebody who started to pay attention probably about six years ago when some of the things that my husband had been telling me about started to happen and affect my own world. Um, things like getting, to, having to uh, use your DNA and having to use your fingerprints to scan in to work in order to get paid. And um, to give you a little bit more about my background, I'm an EMT. I'm an emergency medical technician. I also work in an emergency department as a technician. And I... Um, back then worked in a public hospital, helping to take care of people. I didn't work in any kind of government entity. I didn't work in any kind of super secret anything. So there really wasn't any reason to have to fingerprint into work or to have to scan in in order to be counted as an individual into some electronic system. And I had gone to work one day and all of a sudden that was my reality. If I wanted to get paid, if I wanted to have a job, I was gonna have to scan in. And that was probably the beginning of what I call my awakening. Um, at this point in time, I um, am very active in that I am a New Hampshire state representative. I'm serving my second term. I am the National Director of Legislative Affairs for the Second Amendment Sisters. I've gathered a lot of little titles along the way, but the bottom line is it's because I became more active. I can't even imagine going through the day without knowing what's going on, without paying attention. And um, I think that's really important. A lot of people tend to ask me how I do what I do, and I think that what I do is something that every single person out there can do, and that's be active, that's pay attention, that's make a difference. No matter what it is that you want to do to make that difference, whether it's becoming active in politics like I've done, whether it's uh, participating in civil disobedience, which I've also done, um, whatever your choice is. And I guess my reason for um, accepting the invitation to be here today and to be a part of this project, which is really great. I've enjoyed a lot of the speakers that have come on before me, and there's a few coming after me that I was interested in watching, is to try and get other people to be involved, to stop armchair quarterbacking, if you will. Sitting in front of our computers and chit-chatting is one thing, or yelling at the television set when you see something you don't like is another. But becoming active to actually galvanize change, to actually stop abuses of our civil liberties, that's what we all have to be doing. And that's my reason for being here today, is to try and show people that, you know what, I was that armchair quarterbacker. I was that person that just sat in front of the TV that didn't actively participate. And I have actively participated, and now I can point to things and say, you know what, I was a part of this group that helped make a difference and that we can all make a difference, that it's not a lost cause. Liberty is not a lost cause. Uh, somebody that I uh, admire a great deal once made the statement that liberty is contagious, freedom is contagious. And I think that I've gotten, I've captured that buzz myself and I hope that I am an avid carrier to spread it, to get other people to 
be bit by it and to participate in it in the same way that I have and, and in ways that I haven't even imagined. I come across individuals all the time that teach me new ways to look at things or new things to be involved in. And I think that that is vital for all of us to be able to learn from each other, to draw from each other, to get better at it. There's nobody who's perfect at this. Activism is a hodgepodge, if you will. It, it takes a, a whole lot of people to make it work. But it only takes one person to start it. And if you can be that one person in wherever you live, then you can make a difference. And it's all about capturing what's important to you. What is it that really gets to you? For me, it was the Second Amendment. That, that was a huge thing for me. I'm very much a Second Amendment advocate. I very much believe that the right to self-defense is a basic human right. That's why I got involved in the Second Amendment Sisters, which has grown exponentially here in the free state of New Hampshire. And that's one of the, the biggest causes that I tend to do a lot of work in, is the Second Amendment. Um, some of you who are familiar with me might be familiar with the knife legislation we've passed in the last two years, where we used, you know, in working with politics and seeing that government had a ban in place on certain knives, we worked together to lift that ban. And now New Hampshire can proudly say that there's no such thing as an illegal knife in New Hampshire. There's no such thing as having to ask government for permission to carry your tool. And the government is prohibited from individual towns of making laws, because this year we passed preemption, that are going to take those rights away. So we've had success there. And we recently had success with another bill that expanded the right to self-defense any way you have the lawful right to be. And right now we're working on legislation to try and institute constitutional carry to reestablish our Second Amendment right to defend ourselves without having to ask the government for a permission and then, of course, have to pay for that permission. So it's important to make sure that we as individuals work towards whatever that cause is that draws your heart. I saw a gentleman on here earlier that was talking about um, being a homeschooler and helping other people learn about homeschooling and where their connections can be. That's his thing. That's the thing that draws him in. And he's able to work for the cause of liberty on that issue. Every single person who's watching today has that issue, that one that's super important to them, the one that above all else is the one they'll work the hardest for. And it doesn't take a, a huge amount of giving of yourself to have successes with that. And that's what brings me here today, is to hope that everybody who's watching this and everybody who shares what we're all doing today shares, above all else, the ability to really make a difference, to not be somebody who just sits back and watches the TV or sits back and sees what's going on online, but actively participates, whatever that participation level is for you. Maybe it's organizing a protest rally. Maybe it's making phone calls, writing letters, sending emails, educating other people, using your Facebook to post articles and share. Maybe it's running for office like I did and getting elected and trying to work from within the system to make changes. Maybe it's supporting somebody like for me, supporting Ron Paul and knowing that I want him to be my president so I want to work towards getting that to change. It's whatever it is that you find closest to your heart. And doing things like writing letters to the editor of local newspapers or posting on the websites of your local television station, you can make a difference by sharing a message that way and sharing links. I mean, one thing I always say, and I believe in this truly, and my husband really instilled a lot of this into me, is don't take anything anybody says. I mean, great, somebody told you something. Go out and research it. Look it up. You find evidence that that is true, that, that that atrocity is happening or that right is being stepped upon, then that's what you post. And you post your backup information with it and you share that with people because that's what galvanizes people. And there's been a lot of um, times when I've talked to somebody else about a particular topic and they kind of, you know, gave me the nod. Kind of like the nod I used to give my husband when he would bring up political things and I'd say, oh, geez, here we go with politics again. But then I was be presented with facts. And I've done that, shown people facts. Well, 
You may think that sounds crazy, but here, here's evidence. You know, the last speaker was talking about what happened with raw milk and the Amish. You say that to somebody and they kind of look at you, but you show them the news article, you show them the photographs of the Amish people being invaded by armed, you know, militant dressed people with fully automatic weapons into a community that doesn't believe in hurting anything over the simple thing of having milk. And it resonates with people because you've shown them facts. And it's no longer science fiction. It's fact. And that's really important that we do when we share things like that. Uh, Lauren is asking about do facts of emotion galvanize people? Yeah. Emotion does galvanize people. I mean, it's one thing to hear about something, but how much more does it play on you when it, you can see it within yourself, when you can see it affecting yourself? When you see a tragedy as a parent and you think, God, that could be my child. Yeah, that affects you. And emotion can affect you. I and mean, when we uh, here in the free state of New Hampshire started talking about um, the right to defend yourself, one of the quotes that I was quoted on most frequently out of everything that I had to say about being able to defend myself was that government shouldn't force me to turn my back on a rapist or a robber and try and run away. A lot of people contacted me about that. A lot of people, that resonated because the thought of themselves or their wife or their daughter or their mom having to turn their back on somebody like that gave an emotional tug. And it played with them in a way that they realized, you know what, that's true. Nobody should have to turn their back on somebody meant to do them harm. And I got a lot of positive feedback because of that. I would say overwhelmingly the feedback I got on that was very, very positive. There was one or two negatives out of the tons and tons of mail and calls that I got that were positive off of that one statement. Out of everything that I said on the topic, and believe me, I was pretty vocal about it, so I did have a lot to say. Uh, SWAT raids are often an emotional issue, but the average person can't believe it. Uh, you know what? The average person doesn't believe that things like that happen. You know, really they don't. Until you show it to them, until you show them evidence. I can tell you that the Amish families were raided by armed guards. And people are going to think, well, that sounds a little far-fetched. I don't think that really happened. But if I can show them photographic evidence, then they're going to believe me. When we talk about um, children being harassed by the local police department for having a lemonade stand, most people think that sounds crazy. Show them a picture of a police officer standing over a child at a lemonade stand. Yeah, it's going to resonate more. The more evidence there is, the better. I'm a firm believer in getting things on video, on getting photographic evidence, because nothing speaks. You ever heard that statement, um, pictures worth a thousand words? It really is. I mean, bottom line, if you're trying to show somebody a fact, when you've got something that you can black and white show them is the truth, it's hard for them to, do, to push it aside. It's harder for them to say that you're an extremist or you're, you're being, um, uh, you know, using it as an excuse, or you're trying to sensationalize it, and that's a big one. You know, oh, you just sensationalized what happened. I'm sure they just had a conversation. Well, I'm sure they just had a conversation isn't sensationalized when you have proof and evidence to show that somebody was knocked down, or that somebody was manhandled, or that somebody was yelled at, or, you know, those are the kind of things that people are going to believe when they see it for themselves. And sometimes that's what it takes. Some, and for me, there were occasions for me where it really took that hard, it, forgive me for using an, an, something else, smack in the face of reality to believe that something was true. Because innately, as a person, I don't want to see the negative in anything. Um, by nature, I tend to see the glass half full and the positives of everything. So it's harder for me to accept the negative. But when somebody puts it right in front of me and there it is in black and white and I can't deny it, well, then that has a greater effect on me. And I think that has a greater effect on most people. I mean, most people were galvanized about abuses by seeing it, not by hearing about it. When you see the picture of somebody who's been harmed, 
it's far more effective to you and it, and it draws on your heartstrings and it's not something easily forgotten. The images of uh, war atrocities, the images of, you know, a soldier who, who has passed away and mom draped across the casket. Things of that nature are what affect people. As an EMT, I've seen some pretty horrific things. I had one incident that just about got me to stop being an EMT because it struck so hard to my heart because it reminded me of my own son. I mean, seeing um, back in Katrina, for those of you who remember watching the videos of Katrina, nothing was more poignant to me, nothing had more of an effect on me than watching an elderly woman being physically tackled into a wall and taken down by six 20-something-year-old men for the sole purpose of taking away her revolver, her legally possessed revolver. That image went viral. That image was something that people shared all over the Internet, talked about all over the Internet, and it was something that they couldn't deny. They couldn't say, well, that really didn't happen, or, or she was, she was, uh, she was, waving it around at them. We can watch the video. She never waved it. She never lifted it. She simply had it. She wanted to be able to defend herself and stay in her own home. And the government came in and said, you know what? You can stay in your old home, but you're not going to be allowed to defend yourself. And tackled her and physically took her firearm away from her. That video played a huge role in bringing attention to the topic. And I think it was instrumental for changing laws in a number of states to say that in the event of a a national emergency or a state emergency, firearm confiscation is not going to be allowed. That's the law of the land here in New Hampshire. If we have a state of emergency, law enforcement can't simply take your firearm for the sheer nature of taking it. Law-abiding citizens should be able to defend themselves, and no one should ever deny them that right. So, as you can see, the Second Amendment is pretty much a pretty important issue for me. For me, I think it's one of the most important issues. I think that if we lose our ability to defend ourselves, to possess our firearms without government intrusion, then all the rest of our rights become at risk. It's far easier to shut people up, to stop them from talking, from, to stop the freedom of the press, to stop the freedom of expression, if you don't have the ability to defend yourself. So for me, that's my big issue. So you have to ask yourself, what's your, your big issue? What's the issue that plays the most for you? And how are you working towards advancing that cause? What are you doing to bring attention to it? Are you sharing information online? Are you going out and talking to people? Are you part of the organizations? Are you, uh, you know, making sure that your voice is heard? Are you writing letters to the editor? Are you calling your elected officials and giving them a piece of your mind about a particular issue? Or are you simply sitting there, watching it happen, maybe making a complaint here or there, but that's pretty much it. you got to be a part of the solution. You can't just simply say, oh, the world is just terrible and we're losing our liberties and it's just going to get worse. Well, could it get worse? Sure. But could it get better? I think it could if there's enough of us willing to stand up and work towards making it better, work towards stopping other people from being able to take away our civil liberties. I mean, I'd say probably most of the people who are tuning into something like this are pretty offended by the Patriot Act, are pretty offended by our rights being stepped all over, that, you know, that somebody from the government can simply write on a piece of paper and come take you away, and your own family can't know where you are, and you won't be afforded an attorney, and, and you may not even know why they took you. And you can't tell anybody either. I mean, if you read the way that that's written, you, you can't even, if you're a religious person, you can't even go to a confessional and tell them. Because the law says that's illegal. We should all be standing up and doing something about that. We should all be. That's one issue I think that most liberty activists, no matter what your issue is, can definitely jump on board, can definitely um, join together on. And when we join together on something that we do agree on, that's huge. And I would encourage people to consider this. You may not agree with me on every issue that I tackle. You may not agree with every vote that I cast. But I bet you if you look, there's a lot of issues that we do agree on. 
And on those issues, if we mutually respect each other to work together towards the end, the same goal, we can achieve it. We did that here in New Hampshire with Real ID, with preventing national identification cards to becoming the law in New Hampshire. There was literally seven people who got together and said, you know what, we don't want this. We don't care if the federal government's picked us as the pilot state. We're not going to go along with it. We're going to fight against it. And we literally got people who were anarchists, people who were libertarians, Republicans, Democrats, you name the walk of life they came from together to make a difference to stop something. And we were actually able to stop that from happening here in New Hampshire. Not only were we able to stop it, we were actually get, able to get put a law on the books that says a national identification card is repugnant to the New Hampshire State Constitution. That's huge. And it started a national movement. And there were at least, I think, seven states total that passed laws forbidding it in their states. There was another 20 that passed resolutions saying they weren't, they didn't want to play nice with this. And we've still managed to become, to keep it from becoming the absolute law of the land. There are some places that did buy into it. There are some places that made it optional. But there are other places, just like New Hampshire, where it's illegal. Let me take a second to take a look and see what's, what people are asking or if anybody's asking. Uh, Joseph talks about FrontSite.com. Um, FrontSite is an excellent site. There's a lot of great sites out there and you, that you can get involved in. Um, one of the organizations that was a huge supporter of what I did is Blade Magazine. And if you go to Blade Magazine's website, there's a forum on there where a lot of people communicate and talk back and forth. And it's not just talk about uh, their favorite knife. It's talk about how they manufacture them to a really interesting discussion that got me to start talking to other people to try and find out what we could do about people who are in our military that were returning home from overseas and having their knives confiscated, knives that they legally purchased or got through their service, and then having them confiscated before they came into the U.S., even if they were going to a state where the knife they had was perfectly legal. And like I said, New Hampshire, there's no such thing as an illegal knife, so how could anybody be coming to New Hampshire have anything confiscated? But it's happened, and it's happened in, for states like Arizona where there aren't illegal knives as well. So going to sites like that, uh, Second Amendment Sisters, of course, I'm going to advocate that you check out the Second Amendment Sisters, and their website is the letter, the uh, number two, the letter A, sisters.org. Um, we consider ourselves to have a lot of good information. I would say that we have a wealth of information on there regarding Second Amendment issues. Um, there's a lot of great, great ways of sharing information out there. And don't just look for the like-minded sites. Look for places where people are just simply sharing and go in there and interject your ideals. You may find that people who hadn't thought about something are now thinking about it because you brought it to them. You got their attention to it. It's amazing what you can do with just a few brief moments of your time. It really doesn't take a whole lot of effort to just wake one person up. And for every person that you get involved, there's somebody else who's going to get involved too. And that propagates. And that's what we should all be working towards. It's not an us versus them mentality. It's and us who are aware, trying to make sure that other people are aware too, before it affects their pocketbook, before it affects their liberty, before it affects their right. And that's what it has to be about. Let's take another look. Um, Joe asks, uh, I don't think that New Hampshire will succeed. I do think that New Hampshire is going to do what it can to try and prevent the implementation of Obamacare. There's a great deal of people who are against the national health care scheme um, that understand it for what it is. I and mean, as a health care professional myself, I am against Obamacare. I'm against forcing any United States citizen to purchase anything is absolutely unconstitutional, period. End of story. There shouldn't be any further discussion about that. Um, but un unfortunately, there is. And it takes all of us to stand up against it. I mean, basically, if you live, if your question's a good one in the sense of if you live in New Hampshire, then what are you doing to make sure that the people who are supposed to be writing these laws actually hear your voice and know that you don't want them? 
because you need to talk to them. You need to write letters to the editor. You need to make a phone call, send an email, send a letter, and get your friends and your neighbors to. It's all great if people sit around the kitchen table and talk about it, but if nobody else hears your voice, then it's not as effective. You've got to make sure people hear your voice. The more overwhelming those voices are, the harder they are for people to ignore. And I can tell you from being, from working from within inside, when there are a lot of voices talking, people do listen. They don't just get ignored. And um, especially here in New Hampshire. I don't know what it's like in every other state. I can only speak for the state that I'm in. But in my state, when there's an overwhelming amount of people contacting their elected officials and, and letting them know that something's really bothering them, it does play. It, it does get listened to. It doesn't get ignored. Um, Lauren wants to know if if it's activism to raise children to be independently minded. Oh, of course it is. Of course that's a form of activism. I mean, do you want your kids? You got kids. I have a son. And we've raised him to be an independent thinker. We've raised him to question authority. We've raised him to question everything. To never take anything anybody ever says, including ourselves as his parents, as being 100% gospel without, if he's questioning it in his mind, look it up. Get the information on it. Make an informed decision for himself. And be willing to stand up against something that he sees as a negative and, and to make sure that he's got the tools to be able to back it up. We've always taught him that being an independent thinker means being able to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. That if you want to stand up against something, you need to be knowledge in it. You need to be able to defend yourself on a conversation. You need to be able to supply the truth, supply the proof that what you're saying is true. You can't just simply say, I disagree with you. I mean, that's all well and good, but when you walk away from that conversation, was anything gained? If I disagree with you, and the reason is this, and here's my evidence to back it up, well, it's going to have a lot more power. It's going to have a lot more play. And when I walk away from that conversation, the person I was talking to might actually start thinking that I might be right. Maybe gets curious enough to start looking at it for themselves. Um, from my son's perspective, he's been in numerous situations where he's come home and told me that somebody made a comment to him or he was involved in a situation where his ability to be a free thinker and to back that up with his knowledge really change the perspective on how that situation played out. So yes, absolutely, educate your children. We have to. I mean, it's all well and good if you get the knowledge unless you share it. Without sharing it, do we really succeed in anything? I don't think we do. Um, so basically what I want to try and instill is that a lot of people look at me in different aspects. Some people don't like that I got involved in the political aspects and not just in the civil disobedience. I like doing both. Um, I did a lot of civil disobedience before I got elected. I've been involved in a couple since, but I've tried to do a lot from the interior. I think that when if people look at each other as being partners in liberty, we can achieve a lot more. I mean, when we um, so when we fought against Real ID, that really was a combined effort. We had 200 people at a civil disobedience rally in front of the state house, and the local media didn't want to pay any attention to us. We had people on the inside trying to push a bill to make it illegal in New Hampshire. But when the Internet media, the alternative media, and eventually the international media picked up on what we were doing, it became impossible for others to ignore us. And it was the videos of our 200 or so folks sitting in front of the state house protesting that went viral that made that difference. So it was a combined effort. And I think that sometimes that's another mistake that we do to ourselves as liberty activists is that we separate ourselves. You know, you're either a political or an anarchist and nobody can play in the sandbox together. And I don't think that's true. I think that when you find a common ground, something that you both want to work towards, you can actually work together to be more powerful. The best thing that anybody can do is separate us, is to keep us as factions to keep us as separate. And I think um, when you look at the way some of our governmental laws work, you can see how well that works. I mean, if we're not all human beings, which is the way I like to look at us, if we're all separated by our religion, being um, atheist or Catholic, Jewish or Muslim, if we look at each other as ethnicity, black versus white versus Chinese versus French Canadian, whatever it is, as long as we're separated entities, we're less powerful. 
if we look at the liberty movement, we look at the liberty issues as human beings and nothing more and nothing less. Not politicals, not apoliticals, not religious advocate, not any, just human beings united on one particular issue. I mean, obviously that can't happen on every issue because sometimes people can't work together on an issue and that's okay, that's going to happen. But when you can get together and you can work on the same issue, you can make a huge difference because the power of that force, that mass of people working on both sides of an issue, whether it's standing outside, you know, holding a protest or holding a sit-in, or it's working from the inside and lobbying legislation or writing letters, you put all of that together and it's powerful and it's hard to ignore and it can be extremely effective. So it's my hope that there's more of that. It's my hope that there's more of working together for the united cause of liberty. Because ultimately, isn't that what we all want? Isn't that why we're all here right now, watching these people talk, watching everybody talk about their topic, the thing that galvanizes them the most? Well, if you can stand behind them on their issue, then you can strengthen them in their fight. And maybe we win. We've had some wins. Why not have some more? I think it's entirely possible. But it's really all about what each of us is willing to give. How much time are you willing to give? Maybe you're not going to play that video game. Maybe you're not going to watch that movie. Maybe you're going to take that time and use it towards something better. And um, being personally, I try to use whatever time that I can. I work a full-time job. You know, uh, you do not. For those who don't know, in New Hampshire, being a state rep is not a livable job. It is a true volunteer job, a true citizen. Um, True citizen legislature. We only get paid $100 a year, so obviously can't feed your family for that. I work full time as an emergency room technician, as an EMT, um, to take care of my family. So I find my time in between those things to do other things, to become active, whether it's supporting causes. Uh, one of the causes I, I support outside of the Second Amendment is Camp Constitution, um, which is a camp that teaches children all about their constitutional rights, all about what the Constitution is, what we all should know. I, you, it, it was never more shocking to me to, to watch my own son do a school project in front of the New Hampshire State House, and he'd stop people and he'd say, you know, wow, well, what, what's your favorite TV show? And they'd tell him, and he'd say, well, can you tell me five characters from that TV show that you really like? And people would tell him. He said, can I ask you one more question for my project? And, and people are, around here are pretty pretty good about doing that. And, he, and he, they say, sure. And he said, well, can you tell me what five rights uh, are enumerated for you in the First Amendment of the Constitution? Not a single soul that he stopped that day could tell him. One guy came close. One guy got four of them. And, and finally he gets frustrated and he looks at my son and sorry about that, guys. And he says, um, all right, I give up. I can't think of the fifth one. Just tell me what it is. And my son says, well, it's the right to redress of grievance. And the guy looks at my son and he's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I forgot that one. I'm an attorney. It's that kind of thing that really kind of sticks in your face and goes, geez, you know, the average person doesn't even know what kind of rights they have. So if you don't know what they are, are you going to even have a clue if you're losing them. So that's one of the reasons why I support Camp Constitution is because it teaches kids what every one of us should know. Well, what are your rights? Can everybody watching today, can you tell me what the first five rights of the, uh, you know, the amendment are? I, maybe every one of you can because most of you here are probably people who have already studied that kind of stuff. But ask your friends or neighbors and they're probably not going to know. Um, one of the things that I've done in order to support Camp Constitution, which for those of you who want to know what Camp Constitution is, you just simply go to campconstitution.net. Um, one of the great things about it is that we want to make sure that any kid who wants to come can. And that's why I did write a book called Knives, Lipstick, and Liberty. And I've actually got two versions out there. You can look it up on Amazon. Um, but one of the versions that has a white cover and... Um, you can find that on A.G. Russell's website, on their catalog. You can also find links to it on my website, which is gencoffee.com. Um, we're giving part of our proceeds back 
to Camp Constitution to pay for scholarships. So any kid who ever wants to go can. Now, is Camp Constitution for every kid? Of course not. But for some kids, it's going to be a great resource. Um, and for some families, there's whole families that come in. I went uh, this year and spoke about the Second Amendment and saw whole families up there um, from Michigan, from New York State. And I thought it was really great that they were getting together and spending a whole week talking about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and why it's important. Now, also in the book, um, if you choose to take a look at it and read it, you can see, learn a little bit more about me and what I've done, but you can see my transition from being somebody who wasn't active at all to being somebody who became extremely active. And that's one of the reasons why I like giving these kind of talks is because a lot of times the, com the most common comment that I get is, I don't know how you do what you do, Jen. How do you work full-time job? and, you know, serve for the Second Amendment sisters and do all the other stuff that you do and, you know, be a state legislator. I don't know how you do all of that. I, I think it's pretty easy, actually. Um, easy in the sense that I have a good support system. And that's key. If you're going to get really active, if you're going to really put yourself out there and spend a lot of your time working on it, you have to have a good support system. For me, that's my husband, Billy, and my son, Jesse. They make sure that I have what I need to get things done. I mean, it's the little things like yelling at me to eat <laughs> to um, making sure that I have help. If I'm trying to research a subject, use the people that are around you. Use your resources. You know, Nobody's in this alone. I most certainly have benefited immensely by the people around me, bringing information to me, showing me things, teaching me things I didn't know about. There's always room to learn something new. You never know everything about a subject. There's always somebody that's got a different angle or a different perspective or could show you something to your own structure around you, your closest friends and family that are your support network. And that's huge if you're going to become more and more active in the liberty movement. And to me, that's very, very important. Now I'd stop for a second and take a look. Are there any questions? People, this and it's cool. Everybody's chatting. That's good. That's really good. That's the most important thing. You gotta talk to each other. I mean, anybody who's on the list right now, kind of take a look at that scrolling chat list. Are there people on there you don't know? Because if there are, get to know them. Because obviously, they're here because they think like you. Because liberty's important to them. Because they wanna know more about things. So you get an instant friends list of beneficial people scrolling to the right of my picture. Take a look at it. You know, share contact information, you know, hook up with each other on Facebook, on Google+, Plus, wherever it is that you've known, because you get a whole list of people right there that you can connect into just from being here right now. And it only took seven people to fight Real ID here in New Hampshire. So what is there, you know, 20 or so people on the list right now? What can you guys do? What could you accomplish if you joined forces on a particular issue, whether it's the homeschooling issue, whether it's the raw milk issue? Whether, whatever the issue, there's a lot of issues that are being discussed in this forum that's been going on over the last few days. And I really want to thank um, the guys who put this together because I think this is a phenomenal thing to do to give people the ability to share um, from all over the globe by simply logging onto their computers. I have to admit this is the first time I've ever done this, so I was a little bit leery about trying to use the webcam because it's not something I've ever done. I knew my computer had one, just didn't quite know how to use it. Uh, what are my thoughts on the free market, security, and injustice? Injustice services. Injustice services. Oh, that's a huge question. Uh, free market. Free market's best. That's a no-brainer. Um, when left up to the free market, businesses will succeed and fail. And if they fail, they fail. If they succeed, awesome. And it's all about word of mouth. Yeah, I don't know. For those of you who are around my age, you might remember that commercial when you were younger about shampoo and um, it was always uh, you know here our shampoo is great so you should tell two friends who will tell two friends and they, they duplicate the people on the screen to see how many people would know about this wonderful shampoo well how many people are going to know about liberty if you tell two friends and you tell them to tell two friends and they tell two friends and it grows I mean, that's huge free market operates the same way if I come to you to utilize your product or service and I like what you got. I'm going to share that with my friends. Well, I got this at so-and-so's market, and it was really good. And, hey, their prices were great, and I like the way their business was. 
But we've all done it. We've all been somewhere that we didn't like something. And people are really apt to share something they don't like. Oh, I, you know, went to this market and it was filthy and the cart wouldn't work and I had to wait 20 minutes in the line because the girl couldn't figure out math in her head and the computer didn't tell her my change. How many people have done that? You know, told about a bad experience. Tell about your good experiences. Tell people, you know, about that local farmer that you got the best tasting apple at. You know, tell, tell your friends about um, the local contractor that you hired to fix a problem at your house and what a great job they did. You know, tell your friends about why your business shouldn't be outlawed by the government. You know, people should be free to make their own choices. And in a free market environment, everything will naturally either grow or fail. And government doesn't need to be involved in that. People do a really good job of policing themselves when it comes to free market ideals. Um, about uh, trying to get, I'm not quite sure if I understand what that question is about. About privacy? The private sector controlling security oh. and justice instead of the court systems. Oh, you're talking about um, taking the state out of security and justice. Is there a place for justice in society? It, you know, in relation to the free market. Um, trying to understand exactly what your question is on that. If you're asking me about criminal stuff, yeah, there's a place for justice in society as far as criminal act. I don't personally want the rapist or the robber to get away with it. And and I have no problems with us having a judiciary system for what would be considered a crime against another individual. What we should get away from is when government gets involved in, in what you call a prohibitum or prohibited. And there's a great book out there called The Declaration. Um, look it up. Um, a friend of mine and his brother wrote it, and it does a really good job of explaining the differences in laws between that which is prohibited because government tells you it might be dangerous to that which is a real criminal act of where you have done something to invade somebody else's liberty or take from them what they have. Um, you know, the difference between a, a, a crime that has a victim and a victimless crime. And it, some, there was an occasion once, um, personal story here, uh, where I had an individual who had done wrong by me and my family. And I guess most people or the average person would have probably gone to the police system and reported them and tried to deal with them in judiciary fashion. I made a different choice. Um, my family and I made a choice to go back to our community because the person who had, done, who had wronged us was within our community. And we went out back to our community and did an, an open posting as to what had happened and asked for somebody to volunteer from within our community to act as a third party intermediary between us to solve the issue. And you know what? For us, that worked out very well. Um, turned out we weren't the only person who had been wronged by this individual, so that information came out. And the intermediary was uh, actually present at my home to ensure that there was a uh, fair exchange that the uh, contract that had been between us was dissolved amicably in an appropriate manner and that we were made whole. And here it was an example of people who simply worked together to solve an issue outside of using uh, a criminal court system. Now, is that necessary sometimes? For me, yes. Um, there are times when I think that the court system is beneficial. And, you know, when you talk about government, Government's job, in a way, uh, one of the jobs, is that they're supposed to make sure that contracts are fair and equal, that they're the intermediary between two people who have a contractual dispute. There's supposed to be somebody to intermediate between that, to make sure that each party is whole and no one party is affecting the other. And that's really where government's job should end on that. The, the crux of what's around that contract, of what's the main issue of that contract, um, should be between the two individuals, and it shouldn't be up to government to decide. I, one of the big hot topics in New Hampshire right now is the discussion about what's called a title loan, or a um, where you as an individual wish to take your vehicle that you have the title on and take a loan out on it because you have a monetary need, and you'd be paying that monetary need back to um, that company with an interest, and it is a higher interest rate because you have less time. You know, it's, it, these are one of those kind of loans that you get that, you know, you're paying it off within a month. 
It's not a long-term loan like buying a car, buying a house is. Um, there are people who say that it's our job as government to protect people from themselves from doing this kind of loan. Because they're high interest, we should just make them illegal. I don't agree with that. I think government's job should be to make sure that both sides of the contract are fair, and if there's a problem with the contract, act as the intermediary to solve the problem. But whether or not I decide to get into that contract with you, if you're the business owner, that should be my choice. If I want to choose to walk through your doors and enter into that contract with you and have that short-term loan with a high interest and it's all out on the, in the open and I know what I'm getting into and you know what you're getting into loaning that money to me, then that should be our choice. And I, that's how things, I think, should work. But unfortunately, we have this overwhelming thing in society that seems to have grown generation after generation of trying to protect each other from ourselves. You might make a poor choice, so we just should make it illegal. You know, another hot topic here is, should it be legal to gamble? Well, why not? It's your money. If you want to go gamble it away, well, I guess that's your choice. If you don't want to, well, that's your choice too. Nobody's forcing you to go into the establishment and spend your money. Everybody talks about taking trips to Vegas. Everybody talks about taking trips to uh, Mohegan Sun or any of the other places that are not in New Hampshire to go spend their money. But some reason or another, there's this big fight against not having it in New Hampshire. Well, why? What right does government have to say you can't have that business because there might be that small number of people out there that would use your business too much? I don't think that's a great way of thinking about things. I think the individuals have the right to make their own choices, good or bad, as long as they're not hurting somebody else. And that's the key. Your liberty is yours. What you want to do in your home, what you want to make for decisions for yourself are your choice. So long as your choices aren't invading my privacy, my space, my liberty. That's where the line crosses. That's where you don't be allowed to do things. And I think people will uh, advocate for themselves that way if we're allowed to. If government doesn't stick its nose in between it and saying, okay, you two go off to the sides. I don't think you should be able to do business together. You know, that could lead to an issue. You know, it's kind of like, um, it, it, it's kind of like saying the seatbelt law is a good one. How many people who are, I don't know if anybody's watching this that doesn't live in New Hampshire, we're the only state left that doesn't have a seatbelt law. Everybody else has mandated it because people just shouldn't make their own choices. Government should make it for you. Well, here in New Hampshire, we make our own choices, and we have, I think the last statistic I heard was an 85% of people choose to wear their seatbelt, not because of the law said so, but because their brain said, I feel like I'm safer in my car if I wear one. The rest of them said, you know what, I don't want to wear it. And guess what? Everybody got to make their own choice. Um, let's see. <laughs> the best way to carry a knife is by the handle. <laughs> I highly recommend carrying your knives by the handle. Although, personally, if you're noticing, I do have one around my neck, and I'm rather fond of that. I have a couple, actually, that I can wear around my neck. Um, yeah, for those who uh, aren't, knives are a big part of who I am. Um, I enjoy them. I enjoy collecting them. I have a, a number of them, and thankfully my husband um, not only uh, has no issues with my hobby, but participates. Our only arguments are usually whose turn it is to get what knife. <laughs> and sometimes we just buy his and her sets to make it easier, and then everybody wins. Uh, but I am um, a very big advocate of that, and that, that brings up an, a really good topic, actually, is emphasis of law on items versus crimes. And that was a big push of, of how I got the knife legislation through. Here was an example of government saying, you can't have a dirk, a dagger, a stiletto, or a switchblade, because these four knives government has decided are innately evil in their nature. Well, no, they're not. I got steak knives in my kitchen right now that are far more dangerous than any of the knives I just named. The difference of whether or not one is dangerous is whose hand it's in. It's in my hand, and I'm using it as a tool to rescue somebody out of a burning car. Is anybody going to have a problem with that? Probably not. If it's a criminal holding up a local market, we're all going to have a problem with that because that guy just stepped all over that person's liberty to have business. That person just stepped in there and tried to take from somebody else what they had earned without earning it.
under force. But I could achieve the same thing, whether it was a knife in my hand, a bat, a taser, a gun, a vase, a rock. Pick your tool. People have used any object out there to hurt somebody else. An emphasis on law should never be on an object. It should be on the activity. We got laws that say you don't have the right to rob somebody, and if you get caught robbing somebody, you're going to be criminal, you're going to get prosecuted, you're going to lose your livelihood, you're going to lose. And you know what? I personally don't have an issue with that. You don't have a right to take from me what I earned by force. But we had laws in the books that didn't say that. We had laws in the books that made criminals out of people simply for having a tool. And in this instance, it was those four knives. In a lot of places, it's our firearms. My firearm is my tool. It's my tool to protect myself against somebody who would do me harm or harm my family or take from me my property. It's a tool that can be used for hunting to feed the family. It's a tool that tells me that I have the right to defend myself against a tyrannical government. My ability to own that firearm says a lot of things. It's not innately evil. It's simply an inanimate object that can do no harm to anyone unless it's in the hands of somebody who wants to harm somebody. Pick your object. I can guarantee you there isn't a thing that comes across your mind that somebody hasn't used at some point or another to hurt somebody else. We've all watched videos of people getting run over by cars. We've all heard the horror stories of people who have been strangled by their own clothing. You know, I was at a speech one time and I said, if government was to actually try and institute laws to make illegal everything that's ever been used to hurt somebody, to take a life, or to do somebody harm, we'd all have to be running around in bubbles like, those ger like a gerbil in a wheel. We'd have to be in big plastic bubbles, and we'd have to be naked. But let's face it, clothing has been used for strangulation, so you can't have clothes, you've got to be in a bubble, and nobody can touch anybody else. That's ridiculous. But for whatever reason, people pick these specific objects, usually knives and guns, and say that somehow they're just simply evil because they exist. But then they go in their kitchen, and they get out a knife about, oh, yay big, and they carve their turkey with it. But they want to pass a law that says if I have a knife this big, somehow I've become evil. And this is the kind of thinking that we have to change people's thoughts. And you know what? You can do it. We did it in New Hampshire. I had a lot of great people that came out and supported what we did on the knife legislation. And if you look at, um, it's all in the book, In Knives, Lipstick, and Liberty, One Woman's Journey, about how we changed people's perspectives about knives. And when I put that bill through, mind you, the people who were in charge of the New Hampshire House and Senate were Democrats, usually the people that you find creating these laws, not undoing them. What we ended up with was unanimous support from both the House and the Senate and the governor's signature, who's a Democrat, to put this into law to remove all the bans from the books. So if we can do that, if we can get people to actually look at things for the reality of what it is instead of the fear that they have been sold, then we can do that on anything. I, I believe that, no matter what the topic is. You've got to teach people, educate people, give them the tools to understand what the the real issues are about something and dispel the fear, dispel the myth. You know, why is it so terrible for people to homeschool their children? Well, it's not. We've got to show and dispel the myth that these kids come out emotionally disturbed, that they somehow lost their, their social aspect because they, we gotta, you got to show people, oh, kids are socializing great. Kids are doing wonderful. I know a friend of mine um, who homeschooled her daughter and by the age of 17 she had an associate's degree. I don't think that kid was missing anything. You know, it's all about teaching. If we, if we stop long enough, if we stop being defensive, and we start advocating and teaching, I think we can get a lot farther. When we sat there and showed people the difference between a manually opening knife, an assisted opening knife, and a switchblade, and they realized that you could open all three at the same speed, that the only difference was the, the mechanics. They weren't so frightening anymore. When the law was put in the place to ban these objects, it was done so out of fear. Fear of the dreaded switchblade that was associated with criminals, with gang activity, with the sharks and the jets of our society. For those who remember who the sharks and the jets are, 
Um, Jean is saying that uh, people who say they hate guns love guns in the hands of the state, but not ordinary citizens. Yeah, you know what? You do see a lot of that. I mean, how many people who have actually seen the story of, I think it was a Democratic congressman, I, I, forgive me if I got the story mixed up, who advocated against outlawing guns for citizens and then used a gun to defend himself? Uh, how many times have you heard somebody say that you shouldn't have, we are here in New Hampshire, we had our own governor walking down the street with two chiefs of police saying how, that the average citizen shouldn't have the right to defend themselves, that they should be under the law, if they should try and run away first. Okay, the governor rocks around with his own state police. And the police officers obviously can go anywhere they want to carrying a gun. I live in rural New Hampshire. My local police department isn't always on duty. Sometimes we're covered by the state police. And being an EMT, I've been on calls where I've sat there for a half an hour waiting for a state trooper to come up and declare a scene that we were called to safe for us to enter and take care of whoever was inside. Well, what good is that for me as a citizen? I, yeah, you're right. A lot of times you'll see that. You'll see the people out there trying to say that the law-abiding citizen shouldn't have the right to defend themselves because you have the police. Well, the courts have said the police do not have an obligation to defend us. They have an obligation to investigate crimes. They have an obligation to show up after it happened and try and put the pieces together as to how it happened. But they don't have an obligation to show up there and stop it. And the odds are they can. And for people who have been in that situation, it's literally seconds to make that decision between your life and the life of that criminal. And quite frankly, I think your life is more valuable than the criminal. I think you have the right to defend it. I think you have the right to keep it and to keep your family safe and to keep most importantly, your own self. Uh, if, I know we only have a couple minutes left here. If you want more information about me, um, please go to GenCoffee.com. If you want to contact me directly, you can do so at Jen at GenCoffee.com, and I'm going to have one of my friends post that information for you right into the chat room. Um, feel free to hit me up for any questions or even hit me up on Facebook. I love talking to people. I love sharing ideas. It's how I learn. It's how I expand what I do. And it's how we share the cause of liberty. And if there are any, is there any final questions before we sign off? I want to make sure the next person up has got time to get logged in. And thank you to everybody who had the comments about um, my husband's uh, light box behind me. I love it. And uh, he shares it with me as often as, as uh, possible. Are there any final questions? All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And stay tuned for the next coming speaker. I'll log out now and uh, give the chat room to somebody else. Take care, everybody.